Good afternoon and welcome to this <coughs> community briefing on our ongoing pandemic response efforts. Providing an interpretation for us today is Margie Propp. Thank you, Margie, and thanks to everyone for joining us. I'll start off with an update on our vaccination efforts. Having a safe and effective vaccine for children ages 5 through 11 is a major step forward for our community, and we're making great progress. In just over a week, 15% or 4,400 Lancaster County children in that age group received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine and are now building protection against the virus. COVID-19 vaccine helps keep children healthy and in school and allows them to safely join in-person activities. It can also help protect family members like younger siblings who aren't yet able or eligible for vaccination and other relatives who may be at increased risk of getting very sick if they get COVID-19. Relief, comfort, security, peace of mind, those are some of the words I heard from parents as I talked to them and their children at the clinics. In several instances, the child getting vaccinated that day meant everyone in the family <clears throat> had now received the vaccine and many parents were eager for that moment. I talked to one young man who was probably about five and a half or six with his hands in his jean pockets who told me he just felt it was the right thing to do. This week, we're holding another clinic for children ages five through 11 on Saturday at Southwest High School. Parents and guardians can complete the quick and simple registration process and schedule an appointment online at covid19.lincoln.ne.gov and those who don't have online access or need assistance can call us at 402-441-4200. We're also working closely with the pediatric practices in the community and they ha and have provided them with children's COVID-19 vaccine. Some local pharmacies are also offering the vaccine as well. Children who are vaccinated are children who are protected and we want the same for adults. We know COVID-19 can be more severe in adults, especially if they are unvaccinated. Ensuring that residents have ongoing and convenient opportunities to receive vaccine remains a priority for us, and we continue to urge people to get vaccinated as soon as possible if they haven't already. Currently, just over 61% of our entire population is fully vaccinated, as you can see in blue on this pie chart. 19% of our population are close to 61,000 people are eligible for vaccine but haven't yet received it. That's shown in the orange. You'll also see the 5 to 11 age group represented in green as well as children under 5 who are not yet eligible for vaccine in red. Vaccination helps prevent severe illness, slows the spread of the virus, and aids in our community's progress. COVID-19 vaccinations are offered at many locations in the community on a daily basis. You can find upcoming clinics at the covid19.lincoln.ne.gov website, our local pharmacies offering vaccines at vaccines.gov, or by texting your zip code to 438829. Many people also are also now eligible for a booster dose of COVID-19 vaccine. Evidence now shows that the level of protection can decrease over time, so a booster dose helps boost the existing protection for people already, that people already have against the virus. Pfizer and Moderna boosters doses are currently approved at six months after a second dose for the following groups. People age 65 and older, people uh, 18 and over with underlying medical conditions, that put them at high risk of severe outcomes from COVID-19, and people who work or live in settings where they have increased exposure to COVID-19, like first responders, teachers, grocery store employees, restaurant workers, and manufacturing workers. Booster doses are also recommended for everyone who received Johnson & Jackson vaccine two or more months after their initial dose. The health department is contacting eligible vaccine recipients to schedule booster dose appointments. 
local pharmacies are also offering these booster doses. Booster doses are a critical tool to help reduce the risk of severe outcomes in people 65 years and older. If you're eligible to receive your first dose, second dose, or a booster dose, we urge you to get it now. Our local situation continues to change and unfortunately, it's becoming more serious. Cases keep increasing in many surrounding states and we continue to see increases across Nebraska, in Omaha, in here, in Lancaster County. For example, as you can see on this chart, over the past five weeks, cases have increased in Lancaster County by 33%, which is the blue line. In nearby Douglas County, cases have increased 70%, which is the red line. Since late October, the average number of new cases has been increasing steadily. On the chart, you can see the seven-day rolling average of new daily cases increased from around 80 in late October to 112 cases per day on this past Saturday, November 13th. In addition to increasing cases, we have also seen an increase in positivity rate for people being tested at local clinics and test sites. Since mid-October, the positivity rate has risen each week and was 12% for the week ending this past Saturday. The high numbers of new cases are resulting in more people with COVID-19 seeking medical care and, be admitted to, and being admitted to our hospitals. The seven-day rolling average of COVID-19 patients hospitalized locally shows that the daily average was fairly level through the week ending November 13th. Since November 9th, however, we've seen patient numbers increase each day. Today, Bryan Health and CHI St. Elizabeth reported 107 COVID-19 patients hospitalized. This is the highest number of COVID-19 patients in over a month. 68 of these patients are from Lancaster County. Many of these patients are very, very sick, and some are in critical condition. Typically, 80% of these patients are unvaccinated, and our patients requiring intensive care are almost always unvaccinated. When we see case numbers going up like we are right now, we can expect to see a corresponding increase in our hospitalizations. So in the coming weeks, we are likely to see more COVID-19 patients, adding even more stress on our already strained healthcare system. Local hospital capacity continues to be a very serious concern for our entire community. And joining us today again is Dr. Kevin Richma. As a local pulmonologist, he deals with respiratory issues. He's here to share what he's seen as he provides critical care on the front lines. Dr. Richma. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, uh, thank you, Pat. Um, yeah, just uh, um, kind of for an update uh, to sort of um, solidify a lot of what you just reported. It's, um, yeah, we are operating under a very strained, um, you know, capacity. And uh, my group does the pulmonary critical care here in Lincoln at all the facilities, but we also do telehealth um, uh, throughout the state at a number of locations. And um, you know, no matter where you look, whether you look at Omaha, you look at us, you look at North Platte, you look at Grand Island, um, the story is is the same. I mean, we are um, seeing uh, a stable to increased number of hospitalizations that continue to strain the system. And then those um, hospitalizations uh, overall are over 70% unvaccinated here at Bryan out of our um, 69 uh, patients reported yesterday, 19 um, only 19 are vaccinated. Um, out of the ICU patients uh, taken care of, only one is vaccinated. And out of the 12 on ventilators, none of them are vaccinated. And you can find that same you know, set of information wherever you look, uh, it is the same story. Um, and so uh, as has been stated mil millions of times, the vaccination is highly effective at uh, preventing serious illness, ICU stays, and and uh, ventilators, and certainly death. Uh, and so, to me, um, at this point, 
uh, it, it, it continues to be the most uh, critical thing. And, and if you are not vaccinated, uh, I would highly recommend that you give this more serious consideration. Um, I certainly realize probably down below on these uh, social media things, um, people are, uh, as we speak, you know, putting misinformation and disinformation about vaccinations and, and hospital capacity. Uh, it's it's um, unequivocal. I, I am doing the ICU and um, this morning uh, in total, not, not all ICU patients, but we had 20 patients that had to board in the emergency room um, here at Bryan East that couldn't, couldn't get beds um, initially. Uh, we get calls constantly from outstate Nebraska and different locations that need to transfer ill COVID patients to us or to Omaha or wherever. And um, it's uh, very uh, stressful, heartbreaking at times when we do not have the beds to take those individuals. Um, and again, largely unvaccinated individuals that are having this happen. And so uh, this, this is preventable. Um, we, we have an excellent tool that's safe and effective and it is vaccinations and it's not too late to get vaccinated. Uh, I certainly um, would predict those that are unvaccinated at some point in time uh, are going to get this if you're not vaccinated. Um, and it's Russian roulette. Um, you know, I've got several husband and wife couples that are sick and, you know, one in the ICU on a ventilator and one who had mild illness. Good for the one who had mild illness, but um, if, the, if they both would have been vaccinated, neither one of them uh, or certainly the, the one in the ICU on the ventilator wouldn't be in that boat. Um, and so uh, I, I think um, I can't stress enough how, how critical it is that uh, people get vaccinated. Um, I would say that uh, the other, um, you know, I think piece of information is that um, when we, when individuals get COVID uh, and get ill enough uh, to be in the hospital, the treatments that we have to try to treat seriously ill COVID patients um, really is um, not nearly as effective at, as it is at preventing the disease in the first place. And so those things that we do uh, like steroids and immunomodulating um, therapies, uh, they just don't have the same effect. And, and I can tell you a slew of patients I have right now on the, on the, um, in the ICU on ventilators, all got those treatments. Uh, and every single one of them, I'm worried about whether they're going to, to survive. And if they do survive, um, you know, truly what that's going to look like, um, given that we have two years of information on what happens with, with post COVID. Uh, and so I would just uh, encourage everybody out there um, to, to, um, think about the, the greater good of vaccinations, the clear safety and efficacy that we have on the vaccinations. And, you know, I often hear these um, comments again from misinformed or disinformed people that, you know, this isn't true about the hospitals being full and, uh, oh, you know, we have less beds now. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely a, an economic factor that goes into how many beds uh, exist in a, in a system, if you will. And indeed, we don't have the number of beds that we had, you know, let's say 20 years ago uh, for those reasons. But regardless, right now, that, I mean, those changes mean nothing right now other than we have a uh, limited number of beds challenged by staffing issues and frankly, a fatigued um, healthcare staff. And, and I'm, I'm really worried when you see, as Pat pointed out, those numbers and that the number of sustained hospitalizations, and these people are in the hospital for weeks. Uh, you know, I've got patients, you know, in the hospital over a month. Um, uh, you know, it's just, it, 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 it stresses the system for taking care of those other things. And I feel like we were in a challenging time going into Thanksgiving last year, but, but there was a lot of people doing things that kind of limited some of the other things that we see that strain the hospital system that aren't happening now. And so um, it's not that, you know, these are all COVID patients straining us, but even these 69 COVID patients, these 16 ICU COVID patients, uh, all limit our ability to take care of those other things and accept people from outside. Uh, so, so please, it's not too late. And I will say that number of those patients that are admitted 
vaccinated with COVID, definitely what I can say is um, my experience has been that they are older, they have underlying health problems, and they just didn't quite get the booster in time. I had one person who got the booster, you know, a week prior. That was the only one who had gotten the booster. So if you're in that group that Pat just um, uh, mentioned, be proactive and go out and get the booster because the data shows the booster increases that uh, immunity back to what it was prior to prevent yourself from, from getting uh, sick and even hospitalized. Um, that's really all I, I have. Taking the time to join us today, Dr. Richma, and for sharing the toll COVID-19 is taking on patients and the healthcare providers who are taking care of them. Sadly, today we have one death to report, a woman in her 50s. So far in November, we've lost 11 members of our community to COVID-19. Due to the increase in new cases, our higher positivity rate and the strained hospital capacity, the risk dial is moving from low orange to mid orange today. This tells us the risk of COVID-19 spread and impact in the community is already high and moving in the wrong direction. On the color-coded risk map, you can see the indicators spread across the different risk categories. Our local positivity rate and case rate both remain in the red category. Hospital capacity and deaths remain in the orange category. Our contact tracing is in the yellow category while well, testing turnaround time and vaccination rates are in green. The position of the dial is shown by the blue square outlined in red, which can be seen in the mid orange area. We continue to feel the impact of the Delta variant in our community and our local situation is growing more serious. Vaccinations remain an essential and effective tool to help protect ourselves, our loved ones, and our friends and neighbors. 4,400 children ages 5 through 11 have now received their first dose of COVID-19 vaccine, and those are children who will be protected who weren't before. We have more than 46,000 people who have received a booster dose or third dose, which provides an additional layer of protection against the virus they didn't have before. These efforts also create protection for our entire community. Getting vaccinated, and that means receiving your first and second dose and a booster dose if you're eligible, and wearing a mask are actions we continue to take now to help reduce the risk of COVID-19. And with that, we'll take any questions. Matt, are you muted? Well, you can email the question to me. Or, or, or put it in chat. Or put it in chat. You can email your question or put it in chat. Yeah, it's Bill over at 10-11. Uh, you know, the last obvious one, the mask mandate expiring in eight days with the way cases and positivity rates are going, is that is that still a realistic possibility? You know, Matt, we're seriously looking at that and um, we'll be prepared to talk about it next Tuesday, but I think, you know, where, when we look at where we are and where our whole state is, I, I think that tells tells a story. Okay, we have a question from Matt in chat. He is asking, any chance you have considered expanding booster dose eligibility as some other states and cities have done? We have been talking about the expansion of booster doses, but uh, we're waiting for further direction from the FDA and CDC. That's what we followed, and unless something changes, that's what we intend to continue to do.
This is delegated. Are we still actively testing for the Delta variant? Or is it just common knowledge that that's still the common strain that's that's around right now? No, we. Um, that's a great question. Yes, we are still actively testing for the variant uh, because you probably heard there's other variants there, and so we're constantly monitoring that situation through surveillance, Bill. And it is still the common strain. That it is. Another chat question from Matt at the Journal Star. Uh, any information this week about what percentage of the cases were breakthrough cases? About um, 34, 30, between 30 to 34 percent of our cases have been breakthrough um, in the community total. Um, 80 percent of the cases are unvaccinated in general in the hospital. Okay, with that, I just want to thank you again for joining us today. And please remember to wear a mask and get vaccinated.